friends, you're very welcome to another episode of History Now. We're going to do something a little bit different this week. We're going to talk a bit about music history, specifically the history of one band. The band is Devo and they happen to be one of my favourite bands of all time. So joining me from Los Angeles is Jerry Casale, who's a founder member of Devo, who's going to be talking about the band's origins with the Kent State Massacre of 1970 and forward into the present where a couple of years ago Jerry and his bandmates brought out a history of the band called Devo the brand and Devo Unmasked. So I'm really delighted that Jerry could join me today. But if we can b begin by talking about you and your background in Kent, uh, Kent, Ohio, Kent State, and I know that you know the the Kent State massacre in 1970 was a massive part of your early life. So could we talk a bit about your background in in uh, in Kent and you know what you were involved with in 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 terms of student life? as the massacre was coming up? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> Kent was a, a small conservative town uh, with um, the anomaly of a, of a state university plunked into the middle of it where there were as many students in that student body as town population of non-students. And the students turned out to be just this warp in the culture turned out to be very progressive and, and very activist against the war. So there was the same kind of, uh, you know, cultural civil war going on right in that little town as there was in the country for the last four years with Trump. Uh, and I found myself, you know, being quickly educated about it. I mean, I grew up blue collar you know, authoritarian rule from the parents and from the Catholic school. And I was very unhappy because I had a high IQ and I, I found it infuriating. I, was, I resented the, uh, you know, the treatment I was getting, the, the ridiculous, illegitimate authority that I had felt like I was under their thumb. So by the time I was getting old enough to, to read, and pay attention and be politically aware and culturally aware. I was in high school and uh, I was trying to escape my, my circumstances. And I got a, a scholarship to go to Kent State University. That was the only way I was going to be able to go to uh, college. So once I got there and met a lot of out-of-state students and a lot of interesting professors and my reading list got bumped up, I quickly became what people called radicalized. I don't think it was radical at all. I just think it was aware. Like suddenly, like the allegory of Plato's cave, you weren't looking at the shadows on the wall anymore. You were finding out the myth of America and the myth of freedom as opposed to the realities of imperialism and capitalism. And, uh, and so I was primed for that day, May 4th, 1970, because you know, I, that, that, that was just the icing on the cake. That was the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia without an act of Congress. So uh, Nixon, just like uh, every authoritarian leader, abusing his power, um, decimating the, the uh, walls between the three branches of government. And back when that was happening, the, the uh, electorate was a lot more educated because there hadn't been this 45 years of attack on public education that was put in place after that. So people were enraged. Masses of people were enraged. And students all over the country were protesting that expansion of the war, doing exactly what we did on that Monday morning, May 4th. But the difference was the National Guard that showed up to uh, take us to jail had M1 rifles that were loaded with live ammunition. So it was the old hillbilly song. I didn't know the gun was loaded. You know, we, uh, we stood there and did the typical uh, kind of ritualistic protest and chants. And they did their advance on us with the bayonets pointed at us, tear gas. But then they stopped and we stopped and we're looking at them. They're looking at us 
and we didn't know what this meant. And they were at the top of the hill, we were at the bottom. The next thing I knew, and I know this is contested, but I saw it, an order was given by the adjutant general or whoever was controlling these troops. The troops, by the way, were the same age as the students. And they, they formed a, a front line that knelt and a back line that stood kind of like, you know, 1865. I mean, it was ridiculous. And they shot. You know, and they shot 31 rounds in a matter of a few seconds. And they shot over our heads. I was close to them. They shot over our heads and they killed and wounded people behind me. And it, it was like the typical car accident where you you go into frozen time and it's slow motion and you you're going to shock and um, every normal time is suspended and I turn around and I see Allison Krauss who I knew <laughs> you know with blood coming out of her near the student teacher parking lot behind me and then I hear screaming and a few seconds later it turns out Jeffrey Miller is 20 feet behind me to my left on the, on the uh, roadway. Dead, immediately. Bullet to the head. And uh, I, <laughs> I, I think I had a nervous breakdown. I don't, I don't, you know, back then, those kind of determinations were never made. Anyway, changed my life that day. Everything changed. Did that change you in any way in how you approached, you know, critiquing, you know, the, the system of government and, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's army. Well, you know, it's, that day was like the cliched red pill. I mean, uh, there was just a line in the sand. It was, you know, kind of like my version of no more Mr. Nice Guy. Um, now I was radicalized. I can say that. And, um, I lost my scholarship to graduate school at the University of Ann Arbor in Michigan because the governors of uh, Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Indiana all got, you know, they were all right wing guys, really mean guys. And they got together after that, uh, after the massacre. And they blamed it on out of state students, outside protesters, right? And um, so anybody who had been in a uh, activist organization or anti-war organization, any student, they were forbidden then to go out of state to school. So I lost my scholarship and I put my tail between my legs and begged the uh, dean at Kent to go to graduate school there. And because I had a very high point average, grade average in my undergraduate, you know, four years, uh, he let me, he let me do it. I know you were very active with, you know, um, different student groups in, in the protest movement. I've read that, you know, it, it caused you to be more subversive in what you were doing. Could you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, because it became very clear uh, what the stakes were. Um, you, if you were going to get serious, you were going to go to jail or be killed. If you were going to like meet these uh, uh, autocratic, you know, authoritarian forces head on that were taking over the country, uh, you would have to join the weather underground or whatever. You had to be prepared to sacrifice uh, your liberty. But you are one way or another. And of course, I probably didn't have the whatever it takes, the suicidal resolve to meet it head on and, you know, risk death or jail. So I think that's how Devo came about because then I dedicated any art I was doing to be, to being very subversive. You know, it was early versions of, I mean, I didn't consciously know what I was doing or have an articulated framework for it, but I think it's kind of like what I was doing and what Mark was doing before I met him and then when we got together and did it on purpose was along the lines of what graffiti artists or Banksy was doing. That we were creatively attacking this injust system and 
and trying to, you know, liberate people <laughs> in a, creatively, you know, mentally. That, that fall, after the killings, several high-profile professors, including Eric Mottram from King's College, in your neck of the woods, uh, came as guest professors for a year to Kent State University. And it was, uh, it was incredible. There was uh, Ed Dorn, the poet from the Black Mountain School, you know, and there was, um, God, a guy, Robert, uh, in, Robert Bertolf in the English department, who, who brought in all the most well-known living poets of the day. Suddenly, we were in the company of really interesting people who were cutting edge culturally, politically, you know, technically, you know. Uh, he was bringing in all the experimental filmmakers to speak. I, I got to see, you know, films from Berkeley and San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York City, like the Kuchar Brothers, uh, Titty Cut Follies, documentaries like that. It was, um, it was revolutionary. It was an explosion of information. And that's what started the, these late night sessions where we'd hang out. My, my friend and I, Robert Lewis, the, he was a poet, we'd hang out with these guys like Eric Mottram and Ed Dorn night after night at their off-campus housing and just these long-winded, free-form, you know, brainstorm sessions. That's where the uh, germination of, of Devo happened. Uh, Devo was de-evolution to begin with, and it was... Uh, literary and art idea. It had no, nothing to do with music. But once uh, we, you know, humorously contracted it to a kind of a corporate thing, that's we were mimicking that, satirizing corporate anagrams and logos and what they do. We were very aware of the manipulation of Madison Avenue. We were watching commercials on purpose, but studying them. And, uh, <clears throat> And, and, and seeing through it all. Uh, and, and that's how Devo, it got, it got contracted to Devo. And once that happened, you know, you're off. You're off and running. Now you're just so proud of yourself for these new ideas and strident because they're the first time you've had them, even if they came from other places. And boy, we ran with de-evolution. And that's about the time I met Mark, around 1971, 72, and Bob and I, Bob Lewis and I started like, you know, seeding him with all these Devo raps. And, um, and we realized that what, what he was doing and what I was doing, we called, we called it Art Devo, like, like Art Deco, haha, Art Devo. And it is what I told you it was. It was, you know, it, it was um, transgressive. It was like graffiti art or Banksy now. And it was confrontational, just like I had been politically, but now I was doing it with my art. And that's when I said, why don't we do music? What would Devo music sound like? That's how Devo started. And, you know, I came from a blues background. I was in a local blues band called the Numbers Band, 1560, 75. They were locally prominent, Kent, Akron, Cleveland. We played all the clubs. And I, um, you know, I was working for the lead guy, Bob Kidney, who was uh, quite a musicologist. I mean, he schooled me in rural and urban blues, you know, from the 40s and 50s on. And he had a record collection that was filling a whole wall of, with vinyl, all the best. And Mark was in a, a prog rock band called Flossie Bobbitt. He had been given piano lessons by his parents for years and, um, you know, quote, misused his talent uh, to uh, start playing prog rock. So we said, okay, why don't we apply the same originality that we do in our art to the music? If it sounds like anything that's already a genre or already on the radio, it's over. Forget it. Let's start Tabla Rosa. Let's be minimal. And we we applied the same aesthetic to the music that we had visually to our individual art efforts. 
And that's when we got excited, where we were just making really primitive, primal sounds and grooves with no changes on purpose. And we would have to verbalize to each other why there would be a musical change or a chord change or anything that could be construed as a chord change. <laughs> like, why are you doing that? Why? Because you played eight bars and you think it's time to change? It's like, no, that doesn't cut it. It was fantastically liberating and exciting and quickly it grew into something by the end of 1973 where we couldn't wait to get together. And so the action migrated to Akron because Mark had a, a rehearsal place and a lot of equipment. So that's where the action was. And it was very exciting. behind again behind the music behind what was going on to you know this de-evolution philosophy which I think was the first thing that really intrigued me about the band um, you know there's a couple of texts right back from the 1920s on de-evolution uh, Bertram Henry Shattuck another Ohio native uh, this is at the time you know you had the Scopes Monkey trial about evolution and he's talking about de-evolution Jocko Homo and, and his heaven bound I know uh, one of your songs comes from that. But on through into the 70s, you have Oscar Kiss Mirth's uh, The Beginning Was the End, which you, you, you know, you've also used in your lyrics. How conscious were you and Mark and the other uh, members of the band that you were tapping into what was probably right. one of the foremost ideological battles in American society throughout the 20th century? Well, oh, I was early on. Uh, Bob Lewis and I, we're aware of that, but because people like Eric Matram gave us the historical framework, you know, they found us amusing because we were spouting this stuff like children that just discovered, you know, a new red ball, right? And and they go, oh, well, okay, you know, you've put the e, the D E, you put the hyphen in devolution. Here's here's what devolution was originally, and they showed us that there were political treatises. In fact, uh, they were specifically about the politics in Ireland, uh, uh, the English politics towards Ireland. And there was a whole movement to let things unravel on purpose called devolution, uh, political devolution, which was an, uh, an articulated policy. But we were talking about de-evolution and then they, they brought up what you brought up just just now. And so Bob and I, early on, we realized a lot of the people that we were laughing at and, and getting our kicks from were right-wing ideologues and religious fanatics. But of course, we had twisted the, their take on it inside out because we just thought it was hilarious. And, uh, then, and then Eric Mottram and, and Ed Dorn and others and Robert Bertal, they started telling us, no, you know, this is, this comes from a very serious place. <laughs> and then we got, you know, then, then it was like, oh, you know, we felt like there was gravitas here. There was substance to this, right? So, uh, yeah, by the time we were turning Mark onto this stuff, we were aware of that. And Mark jumped all over it. He was into it. He, he got it. You know, he got it. I mean, we couldn't believe it when I found that book, uh, 
the beginning was the end. Oscar kissed my heart. A knowledge can be eaten. Like, thank you. You know, you put an idea out in the world and it comes back in spades. And it, boy, it just mushroomed. And now, and now that was informing all the songwriting. You know, that's the point. I don't think of another band that that proceeded from an articulated alternate world view in their body of work. You know, that's what I find interesting in retrospect about Devo. Um, none of those songs, I think, would have been written had we not had this framework that was, you know, almost self-imposed, right? right? We infected ourselves with this on purpose, made up our own self-imposed limitations and rules musically to get somewhere on purpose. And that's what's cool about it in retrospect. And that's why, even though all the DJs back then, all the radio DJs hated us, you know, radio didn't embrace us, uh, the rock critics hated us. I mean, the reviews the, are, are nasty. I mean, there's, there's stacks of nasty reviews from the United States and England, especially England, Melody Maker and the other big rags at the time, uh, really mean, really mean spirited stuff. And uh, we, te we really got their goat. We really hit a raw nerve. And, and, and that got us off. It's like, oh, if, if we're getting these people pissed off, these people that we think are bogus, we don't like these people, then we're doing something right. So we're just going to do it more. That You know, we didn't like shrink and go, oh, they don't like us. We're not popular. We better change what we're doing. <laughs> we weren't those people. So can, can I, you mentioned there the, the band relocated to Akron, Ohio, and Akron is a very industrial place. And, you know, I, I'm sure you're well aware of the, you know, sort of, the, the amount of academic papers and PhDs that I've come across that talk about Devo and talk about them in a, you know, a cultural context in 20th century America. It, it's really fascinating as I was reading some stuff for this interview. I, you know, I came across people making the point that some songs off the first album, like Mongoloid, were about, you know, the, the, you know someone in, in, living and working in an industrial society. You know, it's a, a kind of, um, what did they say, they become deprived of agency and a sense of power to the point that, you know, you know, someone with limited mental capacity could do that job. Is that what you were seeing in Akron, Ohio, as you were as you were writing these things, these songs? Well, yeah, I mean, there was all that. There was a lot of things at once, but I think what it was is, you know, by by the time I'm Devo and writing these songs, you know, I've really had it up to here with being victimized, and it started in Catholic elementary school, and it kept going through middle school and you know high school and college where, you know, frat men want to beat you up, you know, the, the rich kids in the class are picking fights with you and laughing at you and making fun of your clothing. And all the kind of entitled insider that always made my life miserable, the mean kids who would pick on the gay kid in the class or the fat kid in the class. And I found it repugnant and disgusting then, but there was I wasn't big enough and strong enough to call them out and beat them up, which is what I wanted to do. But, you know, you have to swallow them and find some other way to get at them. And that's what we were doing. In other words, these same kids would make fun of kids with Down syndrome. So I was writing a song from the mongoloid point of view as well. It wasn't just about that everybody's capacity mentally had been dumbed down so much that, you know, in industrial society, they are mongoloids. It wasn't like using mongoloid as a slur or a put down. It was like, no, the mongoloid you make fun of, no, pal, you're the mongoloid. He's, he's better off than you because he's more honest. You know, that's what it was about. It was, it was angry. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's been misinterpreted in much the same way as, you know, the likes of Ian Jury and, you know, Spastic or Statisticus, you know, he wrote that, as a, as, a, as a protest of how people view people with disabilities as well. Do you think it's been uh, misconstrued 
over the years? No. <laughs> I, I mean, what's happening now is the censorship from the left and the censorship from the right are exponentially worse, and they're, it's like a horror movie where you're in a room and some sadist has pushed a button and the walls are closing in. The walls are closing in from the left and the right where you're not allowed to exercise uh, the function of your frontal lobes. You're not allowed to exercise free thought. It's like they're making you afraid to even touch certain subjects, even for the sake of discourse, which is insane. You know, and then the right wing, of course, they've always been, you know, anti-information. So they're, they're trying to, like, suppress information from their point of view because they just want you to conform and, uh, you know, bow down to Jesus or whatever God. And it's, I think it's worse than ever. And I think technology and the Internet, social media, allowed it to exponentially grow to a degree that we could have never even predicted. We were kind of satirizing that and warning about that canaries in the coal mine, but did we foresee this? No, we didn't. This is far worse than any of our worst fears. The most uh, popular Devo album, Freedom of Choice. Now that came out in 1980. Um, I've been, I've read, and you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, is that it was Alan Myers, your former drummer, who's saying it was about the illusion of choice between the two main parties in America at the time, you know, as Ronald Reagan was coming to power. So, so that's correct. Can, can you tell us about a, a bit about what you were seeing when you were writing that album? Well, you know, when I was in college, I, of course, you know, my philosophy professor uh, had given me Eric Fromm's book, uh, which was called, what was it called? Freedom from Choice, wasn't it? Or something like that. Uh, where he, he explained uh, the psychology of most human beings and how they use their brains, how, what level of intelligence they're at, and, and did experiments where predictably people wanted to be told what to do. They did not want to have to choose or think. They needed the answer. <laughs> and he said what, you, what people want was freedom from choice, and I always remembered that. And, the, and, and, and as the country swung to the right, and we saw that Reagan was going to be the next president, it was like, oh, here we go all over again. This We've never even gotten out under the thumb of Nixon. It's just going to keep going now. And and we saw this, uh, this empowerment of the evangelical uh, religious right and their use of television. And Freedom of Choice was about the trivialized, meaningless marketing of freedom, America the brand, where your choice is like the freedom between Pepsi and Coke. And there used to be a commercial with a Pepsi and Coke test, you know, and people would be thrilled that they picked Coke over Pepsi. And this was what you were being fed. And it was also like this World Wrestling Federation television where here's the wrestler in the black suit, here's the wrestler in the white suit, and you pick a side, you know, like sports, right? And then here's your guy and the other guy's evil. And what that does is it's a, a mass distraction. Meanwhile, the people that really pull all the puppeteer strings and rig the game and make all the money want you to hate each other, all these have-nots, to fight each other and hate each other. We saw that then. Today, again, it's been exacerbated. What's going on now is after 45 years of destroying public education, People don't even understand what we're talking about here. They just think we're grumpy curmudgeon guys that are talking. Don't ask why. Drink Bud Dry. Like, hey, nose to the grindstone, pal. Like, get with the program. And it, it's clear now, with the decimation of the middle class, where the billionaire classes rig the tax system, they make everything and now nobody's around to buy it, which is incredible to me. That they didn't, it didn't occur to them if they decimated the consumer that who's going to buy this stuff? They used to think, well, other countries, upcoming countries will buy it, right? Which, okay, that worked for a while. Well, none of it's working. 
you're watching a planet on fire go to hell in a handbasket, and COVID was the icing on the cake, and whether that was created intentionally in a lab or an accident from a bat, it really makes no difference because it's what, it's what the power structure, it's what the elite, you know, and the governing bodies do with that crisis. Now, they exploit it. They don't help you. They don't solve it. They exploit it. I mean, look what China did. All they want to do is keep control, right? So he suppressed the information about the spread of the virus for six, seven weeks. Then they let us know. And what did our people do? They doubled down. They did the same thing for another six weeks. Now they gave this thing a two and a half month run on the human species. If this had been done with smallpox, there might be about half the population on the planet that there is today. It's, um, it's certainly um, really uh, frightening times that we're in. Can I ask you now, Jerry, a co just a couple of years ago, and everything in my mind, I'm sure it's, I'm not the only one, is pre-COVID and post-COVID, but in you know, pre-COVID times, the, 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 the group brought out um, a history of Devo, Devo with a brand and Devo unmasked. Can you tell us why you felt that that time was the right time to bring out a history of the band? It was basically the, the uh, British publishing company that came to us and said they wanted to do this, right? And other people had come to us and said they wanted to do something, but they didn't want to do it right or even close to right. But when these people heard our ideas, they said, sure. <laughs> they said, yeah. And especially... I was explaining why I wanted to do the brand, like everything we intentionally did and manicured and cleaned and presented to the public that we wanted to as artists. And then on mass, which is the dirty bits that, you know, uh, are behind the curtain and people seem more interested in that these days than anything that you intend, that we wanted to push that to the front and almost make a joke about that by having two books. And, uh, and they liked that idea and that sealed the deal. Now, once we said yes and they said yes, it took five years to get that out. I imagine there's, there's a lot of primary source material from interviews, you know, British and American press, a lot of photographs by Chris Stein and other people. It must have been a lot of undertaking. There was a whole lot of things we couldn't get in there that we wanted. Uh, because of money, because the publishers were making favored nations deals, and there's this new reality in reprinting old articles that didn't used to exist that makes them very expensive to reprint. So some of the best incredible journalism, both pro and anti-Devo, couldn't be in the book because those people like Trouser Press know what they have, and the, the publishers didn't want to pay what they were asking. Same thing with some of the best photos of Devo. If the, if the photographer had become very famous, which many of them did subsequent to shooting Devo in the 80s and the 70s, they, they, they garner a lot of money now in the marketplace and the publisher wouldn't pay. So the book is as good as it could be given the parameters of the financing. Uh, there's a whole other book that could be done. I wanted to do... Uh, uh, every chapter, uh, including the videos that were done with the album releases, because Devo is a multimedia art collective, and the videos are as important as the albums to me. Um, they are they are as central to Devo's reality and aesthetic and output as as any song. But they didn't want to pay what it would cost to digitize still frames, high res and put them in there, and I wanted to do them as like strips, you know, so you'd see a sequence. And they, you know, that's a whole other book now. They, they didn't want to do it. That would be a great book. The story of the making of those videos and the visuals and the production stills would be a great book. In the book, there's a lot of people who come in and out of the Devo story, such as Bowie, who proclaimed Devo was the future of music, Neil Young, uh, there's other people such as uh, Brian Eno, of course, who produced your first album. 
when you you know we were compiling all these things, did you get a sense of a renewed sense of the imprint that Devo has made in music and popular culture? And I suppose I, I want to bring in something else here quickly is that not only that generation of musician, but you know subsequent generations of musicians. You have the likes of Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Rage Against the Machine have all covered your songs. Do you get a sense, a renewed sense, when you're doing a project like this that you know we have made an imprint? Well, you know, it's it's always gratifying to be liked by people that you would want to like you, and that's what happened in the early days of Debo when we exploded onto the scene from you know being under the radar. The fact that you know uh, David Bowie and and Iggy Pop and Brian Eno and Neil Young were excited and responded positively and saw the validity of what we were doing meant everything in the world to me. I mean, you know, David Bowie was a god to me. I mean, I, I still can't believe what that man was able to do in his lifetime if you look at his trajectory and his body of work. And the fact of uh, what I respect him most for is to the end he remained an artist. To the end. I mean, when he knew he was dying, what did he do? He puts sessions together with that band in New York City and creates a new album and three new videos about death, calling it Black Star. I mean, that's, I bow down. I, you know, it's like, I'm not worthy. I can't believe it. He never retreated. You know, he could have just done, started doing silly stuff or, you know, imitating himself or reduced down to some style that people wanted to hear from him. He never did that. In fact, he moved away from things that people loved to doing things that people went, why are you doing Tin Machine? You know, what, what the hell is that? Right? It was incredible. And, and then the fact that a, a new generation picked up on what, what Devo did right, you know, that lasted, withstood the test of time, like you were mentioning with, with um, Pearl Jam and, and, and Bridge Against the Machine and Soundgarden and Nirvana, uh, that, that, again, was truly gratifying. You know, the fact that Dave Grohl reached out when they started the Foo Fighters and wanted me to direct their first video because they were anti-video, but if they were going to do a video, Jerry from Devo, they trusted. It was great. It was fantastic. Bring me on to the present day. You have a new single out. Uh, I'm going to pay you back. Can you tell us about it and where people can find it? Well, you know... I it's just uh, super frustrating and, and um, depressing to have Devo being put on ice year after year after year when I feel Devo could be doing amazing things. And there was so many, it was what you saw was the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I'm an, a senior citizen. And so, you know, I had turned to directing videos for scores of other bands and directing TV commercials for years as a outlet with some kind of a safety valve and and uh, survival tool uh, to be honest and you know uh, I just got so tired of that I, I just wanted to put something out and I had been talking to Josh Fries who's a phenomenal creative force and a great friend and drummer I mean I, I he you know he's so much fun to be around and so creative and makes me laugh and he reminded me that when we were rehearsing for those 2010 shows where we were allowed to go do a brief tour, um, he and I would oftentimes just extemporaneously jam or I'd start to like just make up lyrics there on the spot and we'd laugh, make each other laugh, right? But there were certain things that popped out that were repeatable, you know, that you didn't forget. And he reminded me about I'm going to pay you back and said, why don't we finish that off and record it. Why don't we do that? Because there's that one and there's Invisible Man and there's West Virginia Boy and there's Sex is a Weapon. And I thought, yeah, why not, right? And I did that and about that time, this little record company, Real Gone Records, wanted to redistribute my 2005 solo project, Jihad Jerry and the Evil Doers, Mine is Not a Holy War. And I, they really liked it. And I thought, wow, that's great. You know, now it's far enough down the road that 
it isn't threatening people. You know, jihad did not get the love. I was, <laughs> I was, I got death threats, and nobody wanted to play my songs on the radio. A DJ at Sirius XM said, "I love this song. The time is now. This is a great track." But I can't say jihad, Jerry, and play that, right? So, time enough time had passed, and the world had devolved so far that finally they saw jihad as the satire it was. But they said, "Hey." Could you put some something on it that wasn't there before to kind of make it easier to put out there? And I said, oh, I just happen to have something here. So I then thought, okay, this is serendipity. It's coming together. I'm going to make a video. So I tapped my good friend Davey Force, who's a experimental CGI artist using AI deep learning programs, and he's he's another guy that's just so creative and so cool. You know, he has a day job for Disney, but at night he's Davy Force, <laughs> subversive as hell. And uh, we we collaborated on the video to I'm Gonna Pay You Back, uh, using this new look that he had found. A bullet for your war of attrition and your exploitation of the human condition. A duplicitous man on a curious mission waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to pay you back right now. So many things uh, I would like to ask you, but time is not permitting. So I really want to thank you for joining me today. And it's been very illuminating for me to hear about the history of Devo. And I think more now more than ever the band is so much so relevant to you know our everyday lives i think well i i, I return the thanks because it's rare that i get to talk to anybody that asks serious questions right uh and and, and it's like you're obviously well informed and really smart and that's like oh my god this is such a thrill in a devolved world you know this wasn't a TikTok, instagram thing <laughs> it was so great it's so nice. Thank you.